tonight, Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll read the first three verses tonight in this chapter. Just the first three verses, we'll read all three together. That's Isaiah chapter 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them, and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. Let's pray together. And Lord, again, we come to this time of the service that Lord is special because Lord, your word of your word is opened and uh, your spirit. Uh, we ask that your spirit would speak to us and teach us. And help us to grow and learn and be challenged together and fill our preacher with your spirit. Once again, meet with us. Thank you for, Lord, the, the gift you've given to us that we hold in our hands tonight, your precious word. And help us to, to love it and meditate on it. And thank you again for this service. Meet with us, please, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you. You may be seated. Tonight, I want to bring you a, a message, more of a Bible study. And I, I'm not going to keep you long, but I want to teach you something uh, that I found interesting about God. And uh, I know there's nothing disinteresting about God, but I'm not one who's spiritual enough to say that. Uh, but I found something interesting that I want to share with you near the end of the message tonight. But the message is simply entitled, God's Compassion on His Friends. God's Compassion on His Friends. You say, Pastor, that's kind of a, an odd title, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's very much of an odd title. Because in our last time together, we learned about God's judgment on Babylon and on Palestine. And here's what we learned. And if you have your Bible, I would like for you to get ready uh, to go, if you would please, to Isaiah chapter uh, 14, once again. And we're going to be looking uh, at some verses that are found there. Uh, and this is all by way of review. Here's what we learned about God's judgment upon Babylon and upon uh, the, upon Palestine. We learned, first of all, about the severity of God's destruction because of their sin and their rebellion. Secondly, we learned about the source of their destruction, whom God was going to send to bring judgment upon these nations. And so that was what we learned. And then thirdly, we learned that the judgment that God would pronounce was going to be fulfilled. Just like in our Sunday school lesson this morning, if God said it, that settles it. And that proved that a prophet was a prophet of God because what he said would come true. But then he used a symbol. And uh, I want you to look, if you would please, beginning in verse 12, because probably most individuals, not all, but most individuals have never had these verses connected with the destruction of Babylon and the destruction of Palestine. Why? Because it is only an illustration it also has truth that is more than an illustration. So look what it says here, the symbol that was used. In other words, have you ever looked at somebody and said, that person just has a devilish personality? Or you'll say, boy, that person is as evil as the devil. Or uh, we'll say something like that. Well, we use that not meaning they are a devil. Jesus even used that about Peter. Remember when Peter said, I'm not going to let anybody kill you. I'm not going to let anybody do that. What did Jesus say to Peter? He said, get thee behind me, what? Satan. Did that mean that he was Satan? No. Did that mean that he was demon possessed? Not even a little bit. Peter was a saved man, but he was doing the work of the devil by standing in the way. And he, of course, was not successful in that. This illustration comes after the severity, the source, and the destruction that God pronounced on Babylon and on Palestine. And then he uses this to illustrate, notice what it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning. Now he's talking about the leadership that was there in those countries because of how evil they were. And But now he makes a comparison. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, thou which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
And what Isaiah does here is he uses the devil as an object lesson in regard to Babylon's destruction due to the arrogancy and cruelty of its leadership. Now, we know this is talking about Satan, but the Lord, through Isaiah, pulls in the devil to illustrate how evil these leaders were. So keep that in mind. And if you're one who marks in your Bible, you may want to put that in there. Isaiah uses the devil as an object lesson. Uh, in regard to Babylon's destruction due to its arrogancy. And the Bible mentioned that in the previous verses of Isaiah chapter 14 of how arrogant it was, so full of itself. So when you put all that together, then that gives this passage a context that is never usually given of what the context is. And what is context? Context is everything. You got to give something context or you end up with a pretext and that's not good to have. Okay, we go on. We say the severity of the destruction, we the source of the destruction, the destruction that was fulfilled, the symbol that was used, then the slaughter that happened, and then the warning that was given, and then the weeping and the crying that was a result of the destruction. And so these people were weeping over the destruction because of their own sin, but that's what they were doing. So we went all over that last week, and I wanted to review that with you without giving you all the verses all over again. And when I say I'm not going to keep you very long tonight, I want you to see the opposite of what we looked at last week, and that is God's compassion that he had on his friends. We've already seen the destruction. We've seen the judgment, what God did to the enemies, but what did he do to his friends? Notice this, number one, if you're taking notes, the salvation that was promised. And I don't mean salvation from hell. I mean, uh, he, uh, he delivered his people. So we're talking here, the salvation that was promised. And Brother Penn read these verses with us a moment ago. With that context in mind, I want you to look once again at verses one, two, and three, where it says, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob. That's obviously not judgment. The Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives whose captives they were. Did you see that? And so, it says, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. So now God makes a promise to his people and he says, but I'm going to say, I'm going to save you. I'm going to deliver you. And God promises, here's what he promises in these two verses. And if you're one who marks in your Bible, which many people have done through these studies, you put a little bracket and you, not, you put down what it is, the salvation that God promised. And God promises here, number one, to forgive, number two, to restore, and number three, to resettle his people in their own land. He made that promise. If God said it, that settles it. The old song, which I like, by the way, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. Uh, it's a great song. I love it. And the first time I ever heard it sung was by the Life Action Singers in my home church many, many years ago when I was a teenager. Enjoyed their music very much. But as I've gotten older, I realize if God said it, it does not matter whether or not I believe it. What matters is the fact that God said it. And so here God promises to forgive them. He promises to restore them and he promises to resettle them in their own land. But secondly, and here's something that I learned about the Lord that I wanted to share with you tonight. And maybe, listen, maybe you already knew this or knew it in part, but I never connected it. I want you to notice number two, the sarcasm that was allowed. The sarcasm that was allowed. You mean God was sarcastic? Let's read and find out. Chapter 14, verses 4 through 11, and with that thought in mind about sarcasm, follow along and keep that in your head. Verse 4, that thou shalt take up a proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. 
he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger and persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against thee. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou also, art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy violence, the wormwood is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. Now, what I would like you to do before I give you the parallel that I, ta- that I learned is connect this with the illustration that was given about Lucifer. Because it talks about his fall and here it speaks of Babylon's king's fall. So Israel here now is invited to taunt its enemies, especially Babylon. And I ask the question, Sarcasm? Taunting? One might say this is so unlike God. And how could God do and allow this kind of behavior? Well, truthfully, it's not unlike our God. It's just atypical. It's not unlike him. It's just atypical. So I here's what I started to do. I started to write down other verses that would back this up about God's sarcasm, about God's taunting. And here's what I came up with. You might want to write these verses down by this passage, by verses, uh, uh, what was it there, Um, uh, 4 through 11. First of all, Psalm 2, verses 1 through 5. I believe all of us know these verses, at least to a certain extent, where it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Say, pastor, what does derision mean? I'm so glad you asked three words that I would like to give you. It means to mock. It means to deride. And it means to ridicule. And it says the Lord will do that to them. And then it goes on to say, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. So like I said, it's not usual for God to be this way. It's it's not unlike him. It's just kind of atypical. Another passage that I found and I looked up was Psalm 37, verses 12 and 13. And as I said, some of you may already have these things marked in your Bible for, you know, you've done your own reading and studying. But let me give you this one. Psalm 37, verses 12 and 13. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him for he seeth that his day is coming. That phrase that said, your day is coming. When I was in Bible college, we would have water fights in the dormitories. We shouldn't have done that. But I don't repent, not even a little bit. And I lived in the bricks at Hiles Anderson College. And so we had, you'd come in from the hallway, and then there would be another hallway, and then there would be a lineup of, of rooms. And uh, we'd get in squirt gun fights and water cup fights and everything else. Well, one of my friends went in and filled up a, uh, a trash can full of water. Uh, This was an overachiever, and he was my personal friend, and I'm glad I was not the recipient. Well, wouldn't you know it, the the executive vice president of the college decided to step in from that hallway into our hallway, which was before our dorm rooms, just exactly at the moment that Bob was drawn back with his trash can full of water, and when he stepped in, he let the water go. He didn't hit a one of us but he hit the executive vice president of the college who just stood there. His tie got heavy and went down. His light blue coat was now dark blue. His hair was messed up and he just stood there. And then he started singing. There's a great day coming. (laughs) 
And every time he would see us in the hallway, he would sing, there's a great day coming. Well, is that exactly what God just said when he said, for he seeth that his day is coming. And I added that story only because I wanted to hear it again. Okay, just in case you're wondering. But there's another passage that expresses this attitude that God has toward rebellion. And like I said, it's not, it's not, a, it's not, uh, it's not unlike God. It's just atypical of God in Proverbs chapter one, verses 24 through 26. Proverbs chapter one, verses 24 through 26. It says, and this is because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity and will mock when your fear cometh. It's not a good thing to ignore what God has to say. Not even a little bit. And then the last one, it shows God, I think it shows God's humor. And yes, God has a humor. I know that because he, he made me. But I know that God has humor. But there's a story in the book of Exodus chapter 14 that every time I read it, it makes me laugh out loud. Let me read it to you, beginning in verse 23 and reading to verse 25 in Exodus chapter 14. It says, And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in, uh, to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, you remember this story. Moses and the people of God were, had walked through the Red Sea on dry ground, and, uh, and Pharaoh decided it was time to chase after him. And so of all the dumb things to do with water on one side and water on the other, he told his men to go on down in there and go across just like they did. But, now, but look what happened. This is interesting. It says, And it came to pass that in the morning uh, watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their per 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 took off their chariot wheels. But notice what they did, and they drave them heavily. <laughs> Didn't matter if they had wheels or not. They just kept riding and kept beating those horses and trying to get those chariots to go. But I think it's interesting that God just sort of reached out and pulled off their wheels. And I guess he had them in derision, to be honest with you. And it says, and let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. So is, is it unlike our God to perhaps be sarcastic or perhaps to be taunting toward the enemies of God? Well, it's not his usual thing. It's just atypical when he does it. We know that God is love, but God is also taunting sometimes. And I just have this picture in my mind of God reaching down and pulling off those chariot wheels. And the funniest thing is, is those guys kept pushing them horses and kept driving them. I think I would have got off my chariot and went back the other direction. But he drowned them because the Bible says in that same passage that God made the waters return and he protected his people. As I've said before, if I were the enemy of God, I would not want to remain so. If I were the enemy, of say, but pastor, you're saved. You can't be God's enemy. The Bible doesn't differentiate between rebellion of a Christian and rebellion of an unsaved person. They all recoil against the Lord. And probably every person in this room at one time or another has recoiled against God over something in their lives. And the Bible says that if we love the world, we're the enemy of God. And I want to say once again, if I were the enemy of God, I would not want to remain so. And so that's something that I learned. And like I said, many of you probably already knew this about the Lord, but I found it interesting that God said of them, he would have them in derision and he would, uh, he would mock them and he would deride them because of their rebellion against God. But then I got to thinking and I looked up these other passages and I thought, yep, it's, it's not his usual way, but, it, but it's not a tip. It's just atypical. It's not how he is all the time. And I'm very, very thankful for that. Shall we stand for a word of prayer? And our Heavenly Father.